Welcome to the Heinz Nix of Museums Forum, the largest computer museum in the world. Here at the HNF, we want to celebrate the World Computer Day today on February 15th, 2022. My name is David Wodkowski and I thought, yeah, we probably do not do some big event due to the pandemic. So what could we do? We could do what everyone in a pandemic does, fire up their Zoom client and call some people to talk to them about things that matter. And on World Computer Day, what matters is computers. You guessed it. Yeah. And in particular, the topic of this year's World Computer Day is the MOS Technology 6502. That's a piece of hardware, a processor to be precise, which was used in quite a few um, computers from the late 70s and the early 80s, many of them are on display in our museum. And the most valuable and probably most interesting of them is our Apple One. Just last summer, we uh, got our Apple One running again. You can uh, find that in our YouTube uh, stream. And yeah, I thought, let's dig a bit deeper and call people up who can talk about the Apple One, not R in particular, but the machine, the ecosystem. It was built in the culture around it. And um, that's what I did. So what you see now are um, a couple of recorded Zoom interviews. So please expect clipping hands and uh, uh, awful visuals, um, but also expect interesting content and interesting stories worth telling and worth hearing. Have fun. Our first um, guest on our channel today is uh, Jim Scherer. He's uh, head of the Compuseum um, in Philadelphia. And uh, he yeah, kind of came up with the idea of a World Computer Day. And I uh, wanted to talk to him about uh, why do we need such a day, Jim? Great. Thank you for the introduction. So we'll talk a little bit about World Computer Day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> got a little sign here. So what is World Computer Day and how did it happen? This is an invention. This has never occurred before. Uh, many of us in the computer industry wondered why we didn't have our own day to celebrate the transformational benefits of computers. We were inspired by Earth Day which was founded in 1970. They've just had their 50th anniversary. It's probably the most successful single day celebration ever. It has a foundation and a very strong budget for celebrating the earth and uh, keeping it uh, healthy. So we said, why not World Computer Day? This happened the, uh, a year ago as we were celebrating the 75th anniversary of the ENIAC. So the ENIAC, you may know, is the first electronic, uh, all electronic programmable computer. And this is a vacuum tube from the ENIAC computer. So I live here in Philadelphia in vacuum tube alley. And uh, these were important switching devices for the ENIAC created in 1946. So in celebrating the 75th anniversary of the ENIAC, we made that the first year of World Computer Day. So that's how World Computer Day came to be. Yeah, great. And um, this year, you chose another topic, and the topic you chose is the microprocessor called 6502. That's a processor that was used in quite a lot different machines at the time. Could you tell us about that one? Uh, the sure. Happy to talk to you about the 6502. What's interesting uh, to be involved with the Comp Museum, whose mission is to create a museum and spread news about the use of computers uh, and the inventions in computers and the innovations in computers, that the, is that you find very interesting things in your backyard that you hadn't known about before. And the 6502 chip is just that thing. 
So the 6502 chip uh, was created in Valley Forge, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, site of the uh, U.S. Revolutionary War. And so they like to call it the second revolution chip, the 6502, the chip that's changed the world of personal computing. So the 6502 was created by MOS Technologies, M-O-S Technologies, in Valley Forge back in the 70s, in the 1970s. And it became uh, a chip that was uh, incorporated into the first Apple computer, the first uh, Commodore computers, and the first Atari computers. Most people don't know about it. I didn't know about it. We're all discovering the inventors of the 6502. Many of them have passed. We're trying to find uh, those who were involved in those early uh, transformative times for the 6502 and have interviews and celebrate that chip. If you could, from all these um, machines, choose your favorite uh, of all the 6502 powered computers, what would it be? It's a great question. It's a very great question. Um, it's hard to pick a favorite, it really is. They all have idiosyncrasies that we might uh, uh, like or not like. But um, when you look at the, the valuations uh, of the sale of these original computers, the Commodore, uh, all the models of the Commodore, the Atari, all the models of the Atari, and the Apples, all the models of the Apples, The Apple One fetches nearly a million dollars for each unit. So that's kind of an exciting thing people share in its value and its vision. Oh, yeah. So um, I chose uh, this um, video background today because that is my personal favorite. Um, that is a computer you put into your shoe, into your shoe and wear it to a casino. That's why these uh, casino chips are uh, built there. And um, the idea um, is from uh, Claude Shannon himself, but this one was uh, built in the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s by uh, J. Doyne Farmer. And this is made by, um, by him uh, with the parts of uh, Kim One. The Kim one was a one board computer powered by the 6502, yeah. which you had to assemble yourself. And he uh, took those parts and assembled a completely different computer. And you, you control it by tipping your toe on the little switch on your, <laughs> on your foot. And it uh, calculates the trajectory of the ball and the um, roulette um, table. And uh, yeah, the idea is that you win more with this uh, small <laughs> computer chip. That's a <laughs> you do not buy these by and with money. You just go to a museum and think, yeah, that's simply a great idea. It's a great story. Thank yeah. you for telling. <laughs> Thank you as well for. Um, being with us today and thank you for com coming up with the idea of a World Computer Day. Um, and I, I hope there are many uh, great things people do to, to celebrate this day and celebrate the, the 6502. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Have a great day. The next guest on our channel is uh, David, David Murray. He's a YouTuber uh, known as the 8-Bit Guy. He does uh, a lot of um, computer restoration works and uh, um, programs for these computers and discusses their uh, functionality and workings. And um, yeah, great to have you with us today, David. Thank you. Um, Yeah, let, let's start off. Uh, you, you got a YouTube channel where you restore and um, repair computers of uh, the yeah main, mainly 80s. What fascinates you about these? Well, obviously, I grew up in that time. 
and uh, I got my first computer probably around 1981. So, you know, I've always had that interest for those computers, but um, I also just find them uh, interesting, even playing with ones that I didn't own at the time, simply because um, they're easy to understand. Like, um, compared to a modern computer, uh, they're just so complex, and they're so, like, if you were to look at a schematic of one of the uh, processors or something. I mean, it would take a lifetime to figure out how it works. Whereas these old 8-bit computers from the late 70s, and early 80s, they're relatively simple to understand. And it's fascinating looking at the different ways, the different approaches from the different companies and uh, their designs and, and how they thought each one might be best. So, um, in, in your opinion, do you have a, a favorite computer from that time? Uh, my favorite computer from that time would be the Commodore 64. Okay. Yeah. Why on that one? Because it's the, the most famous or most widespread, or what is it? It could just be because I spent so much time in front of one. Okay. Um, and I don't know, They it, it has a certain appeal to me um, with just the user interface, the, um, the basic, the operating system, and the various types of games that were available for it. Uh, I don't know, some of it's probably just nostalgia, but, uh, you know, I think the, the C64 has a really good balance of, yes, it's old, but it also has enough new features. I mean, compared to the Apple One, for example, which came out just a few years earlier, um, the C64 is 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 like, a, you know, a thousand miles ahead. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to explain. Okay. Um, just uh, uh, in my virtual background, I brought some some oddity from that time. You might recognize this machine. It's a, yeah. a Commodore VIC twenty, um, but it's the the German version. Um, Commodore uh, or their partners here in Germany marketed it, is it as uh, the VC twenty because Volks computer. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's that's one thing. Voice computer is kind of computer for the people, and it's um, the, yeah um, a nice uh, nice idea to market it. The other problem is that if you say Vic Twenty in German, it comes over as some kind of obscenity. Uh, yeah. so they, you, yeah. you don't know. Uh, vielleicht vergessen Sie, dass uh, ich Deutsch spreche. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you really do. Okay, so. Um, For a German speaker, it's uh, op kind of obvious why you would not risk <laughs> having that on a um, television ad or something. Um, you just um, said that um, the the C64 is um, way ahead of the Apple One. Um, the Apple One is the the machine I'm I'm talking with my guests uh, today. Um, Could you give some some comparison? What what makes the Apple One so let's say early technologically speaking? What makes the six um, C sixty four so so much ahead of it? Well, I mean, let's be fair. The Apple One came out in nineteen seventy six, and the C sixty four came out in nineteen eighty two. The computer industry was making leaps and bounds during that that period. So um, the Apple One is. <laughs> I mean, let's be fair, it's really a terrible computer. Um, I mean, I don't know anybody that wants to sit down in front of an Apple One and spend any time, you know, playing with it or programming it or or anything because it really can't do very much. But when it came out in 1976, it had the advantage that it was fairly affordable uh, for a, a normal consumer to purchase one. Um, and it had a video display built in. I mean, it, it had video output built in, where at the time, most any computer you would have purchased would have cost a lot more money and required a DOM terminal to connect to it as well, which would have been an additional expense. And because the Apple uh, Apple One put all of that into a single board, you finally had a computer that was affordable for a regular person to buy. So and that that's really the, the, the primary thing that, that that sets the Apple One apart from uh, other computers at the time. So just for, for context, the Apple One costed uh, $666 and a typical um, 
computer of the the following years would cost more than than a thousand dollars am i right with that right when uh, when you did uh, your video on the apple one uh, last summer you told your viewers that you do not own um an original uh, part but uh, you you worked with the with a replica you assembled yourself what it was uh, some kind of a kit for self-assembly is it the same to work with a replica or um is there still, is still something special about the original one well it depends um there are different products out there that claim to be an apple one replica and some of them are apple one replicas which is the one that i did for example Well, really, I didn't do, I didn't work from a kit. I pretty much just assembled all the parts myself uh, from various sources. But there's a lot of products that you can buy today that claim to be an Apple One replica, but that's really false advertising, in my opinion, because yes, they're Apple One compatible. They'll run Apple One software, but if you look at the board, it doesn't look anything like the original. And part of the reason they're doing that is because uh, many of the original parts on the Apple One are extremely difficult to find. And when you do find them, they're very expensive. So it's kind of hard to make an Apple One replica kit today that costs like $50 or $100 when it costs $300 just to get the parts, you know, to, to build one. So what they've done is they've, they've taken the Apple One design and they've substituted some modern parts and redesigned the board. They've made it, instead of the board being this big, it's like this big. And those aren't real replicas replicas in my opinion um they're just apple one compatible is all I, i can say about it but the one i had or the one i built which i'm sorry i don't have it here with me at the moment but um it is exactly the same as using an original i mean there is no difference um in fact you know prob i don't even know if steve wozniak himself could tell the difference between the one i built and the one he made other than you know he might be able to look at the soldering and say well i solder different than that or or you know something like that but as far as the way it looks sitting on a table it looks identical it works identical there's there's no difference okay so there's still um the possibility to build really close uh closely matching um apple ones today but it costs a lot of money because the parts are uh, at least in part hard to get and uh, yes. cost and costly um and you said there's hardly anyone who can program on these uh, machines because um because they are so um there yeah what's what's the problem when when programming these Well, there's no problem programming them. Um, it's just that there's not a lot you can do on them because they don't, they don't have, uh, there's no graphics modes. There's no sound mode of any kind. Um, you can't even like the character set is only 64 characters. So you don't even have, I mean, at least with the Commodore pet, you had 256 characters and you had those little graphical pet ski characters. You could kind of, you know, put them together and make some sorts of like, graphic images you know but with the apple one all you can really do is display text on it and and it's all uppercase you know capital letter text there's there's not even any lowercase letters so i mean the number of things you can do with it is just really small i mean it it uh if, if you want to play like a, a text adventure game or something you know maybe you could do <laughs> you know something like that but um yeah I think most of us, if we want to sit down and, and program a computer, I mean, we may not necessarily want the latest and greatest, most modern computer with the most power and all that kind of stuff. But if we're going to, if we're going to program a computer from the the seventies or eighties, we at least want one that's capable of, of minimal things that, that we can use to accomplish what we want. Like if we're writing, most, most people today want to create a game or a demo and The Apple one is just not well suited to either one. Okay. So it's uh, indeed um, one of the first machines, but later machines were so much more capable and so much more useful that uh, they're yeah, more, in more interesting these days for, right. for people like you. Okay. 
yeah, thank you very much for this short interview and uh, great to have you with us. At one point in time, um, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak started building Apple One machines. And sometime Steve Wozniak produced the very first Apple One, which looked more or less like the one behind me, which, by the way, is the one uh, on display in the H&F. But that very first Apple One, is that still available? Um, do we have to know who owns it? And the answer is yes. And the one who owns it is Liza Loop. She's with me now, and it's, it's great to have you here. Uh, Liza, and just start off with why do you, who's not a techie, but uh, more, more an educator, why do you specifically own the first Apple One? And first of all, is it true that Steve Wozniak himself gave it to you? It's true that he gave it to me. Its owner is actually a nonprofit corporation, which is Loop Center, that I started in 1975 um, to work with kids and computers. Um, the Apple wasn't made until 1976, so I was working with kids and computers before uh, Was and Jobs made the, uh, the first Apple. Um, and yes, um, they designed it uh, in their homes and built the first ones in their homes. There were prototypes before this one. This The one that, that uh, Was gave to, to me and to Loop Center was um, the first one off the assembly line. This is the first official one. He, Steve told me that he um, designed it and built it for use in education, as an educational tool, uh, both to learn about computing and to learn about um, programming. Um, so he wanted the first one to be used in education and to go to an educational organization. And what he said was he, he went to pull it off the assembly line and um, said he was going to give it to Loop Center and Steve Jobs said wouldn't let him have it. Uh, so Steve Wozniak had to pay $300 to buy the first Apple One to give to Loop Center. That is a, is a great story. The Homebrew Computer Club is famous for the place where uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak met and is kind of the the ecosystem where where the Apple One was um, was created and um, maybe also discussed and, and tested. And what was that like? These uh, these computer clubs of that time. Well, first first I want uh, to um, improve the historical record. Yeah, I don't believe that that. Jobs and Was met at the Computer Computer Club. They were in the same public school together as teenagers. And they knew each other from childhood. Um, they did go to the Homebrew Computer Club much more than I did because I was living 100 miles away from it. So for me, it was a big trek to get there. And I only went to three or four meetings. I was not uh, um, an aficionado. Um, Part of the reason that people associate me with it is that um, I've been active in making the newsletters available, and I I talk a lot. Um, it's not that I was as as active in a, in a whole group club. Um, the the meetings that I was at were um, they they took place at Stanford, um, at uh, in one of the big auditoriums at Stanford. It was, it was famous because there were a lot, a lot of people went. It was the largest of the computer clubs, but there were computer clubs all over the country of a um, combination of high school students and engineers and professional people um, who wanted to talk about their hobby um, and share with people of like minds, which is, of course, the primary way we educate each other. <laughs> um, so. This was a, a non-school for people with an interest in computing, and they were, they, as I said, they were all they were all over the world. I subsequently visited uh, computer clubs in the Soviet Union, um, 
and corresponded with computer clubs in lots of different places. Um, it, the Homebrew Club, because it was large, uh, met in a large place. They had a structure where they had an invited speaker. Um, they did an introduction, and then they did uh, had, had somebody who did a presentation, pretty informal, but um, interesting usually. And um, then they had a sharing section where anybody could stand up and say, this is what I'm doing, raise your hand. This is what I'm doing. This is what I need help with. This is what I want to share with you, um, which was very informal. And the one of the meetings that I went to, I stood up and raised my hand and said, um, I've got this public access computer center and I'm throwing as many computers as I can find in the back of the pickup truck and taking them to schools. And that happened to be the meeting where Waz was most of the time sitting outside the meeting in the hallway, um, writing a basic interpreter for um, for the Apple, uh, which was in prototype. That was, I, I believe, that was before um, it had, any any uh, production models had been built. Um, so. Uh, he came up to me during the sharing session and said, you're taking these into schools? Would you take one into a school? And I said, sure, I'd love to. So it was uh, uh, a month or two later, I believe. I don't have the dates anymore. That was a long time ago. Um, it was a month or two later when... Um, see, Wozniak and, and Waz says that Jobs came with him. I don't remember meeting Jobs. I remember meeting Waz. I met Waz, I met Jobs later. Um, and brought me this pizza box. It wasn't literally a pizza box. It was a, a that shape brown cardboard box. Said, I have a present for you. Um, and I said, thank you, and opened it. This is at a meeting of the Sonoma County Computer Club. And uh, he's, uh, I said, well, this, this is a, a lovely um, printed circuit board. Uh, what do I do with it? Because again, I'm not a techie. <laughs> and he said, oh, you find somebody to build you a box, somebody to build you a power supply. You go down and buy a Cherry Pro keyboard and plug it in here. And, um, and then you get a, uh, an audio, a little audio cassette tape recorder and here's the basic language. And you load the basic into the into this now working system, um, and uh, then you can program it. But so of course, if you unplug it, so it really was the the board and um, no no what we today would call peripherals, no no monitor, keyboard, and even no power supply, just the board, a bit like the one behind me, and nothing more. And you, you took it with you, and uh, you told me before that uh, you indeed use it for some something productive in in your... Uh, oh, yeah. I, um, it, it, the problem with it, that Apple one, that first one, which is probably a problem it still has, is it only ran for about 20 minutes before it crashed. Okay. Uh, in, in the American school system, uh, a class is 40 minutes usually. Um, so uh, I took it to uh, the Windsor, California Junior High School. I was invited to come in and teach programming. And um, I, we couldn't get into the room where the class was held um, before the class started because somebody, another class was meeting in that room. So I would come in, plug it in, start to load basic from the cassette recorder, um, at, which only loaded one out of three or four times correctly. It took 20 minutes to load the basic. So during that 20 minutes, while I was hoping with my fingers crossed that the, the basic language would load, I taught a little bit of the R equivalent of a Hello World, world program. Um, at the end of the 20 minutes, we had to check and see if when we typed run, we got anything on the monitor. If so, some one of the kids would, as fast as he could, type in their program, and if we were lucky, we could run it within that 40 minutes. If we were not lucky, 
we couldn't because the machine had crashed or the program hadn't loaded properly. Uh, so I, because of this, I went back to Waz and said, you know, I love this idea. I'm happy to have a computer, but I can't use this for an education. It doesn't work in the ecosystem that I have to work in. And uh, can you fix it? So um, I gave it back to Waz. And every month, I'd call him up and say, you got my computer for me yet? And after a couple of months, he said, um, well, it still isn't working right. Actually, I think he gave it back to me once and it still was crashing, so I gave it back to him again. Um, it still wasn't working right. He said, don't worry, I've got something better for you, which was Apple II, number 10, that I also have. <laughs> and that worked much better. That's a um, really fascinating, fascinating story about the the issues with the with the first uh, first board and um, I'm sure was was really trying hard to to fix those issues and but um, as we know later uh, later boards did work more reliable and work work for hours. Liza, it's great to to meet some from, someone from from that time and someone who who tells all these these stories from from a time where myself <laughs> wasn't even born and um, many of our audience probably wasn't as well um, great to have you on our channel and great to have you share your your story with us um, thank you for being with us what is the on the uh, virtual background behind me now is again a picture of the Apple One on display in the H&F in Paderborn, Germany. And, but this is not from our website. It's from a website called the Apple One Registry. Oh, I believe my, yeah, there, there it is. Um, the Apple One Registry was founded in 2010 by a guy called uh, Mike Williger and since 2018 Achim Baki is uh, maintaining this registry and uh, Achim is with me today. Great to have you with us Achim and um, I wanted to talk to you about what is this uh, registry about, why do you do that and yeah. Okay, so first at all, it is a list of all known Apple One computer. So it um, it is a list to preserve the history of all Apple One computer. The main problem is Apple, the company, do not care about the history. So someone has to do it. Someone has to preserve the history of it. And Mike Whitaker re realized when he made his replica of the Apple One that no information exists how many Apple One really exists um, in 2010 and who are the owners, the whereabouts. So he decided to make a list. And in 2018, I took over this list and I found quite a lot more Apple One than he found. So now we have 62 Apple One and 20 maybe more that's it. So um, you aim to build up um, what what could be a complete list, but uh, until now the the list is not complete. Uh, there's some uncertainty. Uh, you said maybe twenty more. Um, why is there such a comparatively great amount of uncertainty when uh, one could simply say, okay, you you. Uh, Look around, count all the the boards you find, and and that's it. Why why is this uh, listing so difficult? It is uh, real hard work to find all these at the one. So the main problem is there is no source. You can have a look at the internet. You may find some at the one. You may find some owner, but most is confidential. Most are in private hands. So. You, you need to find someone to tell you there is an Apple One, I know someone. And then you have to try to contact this person. And sometimes the Apple One owner contact me directly. So now I have contact to quite a lot of Apple One owner. But for some Apple One, we have just a picture 
uh, just an information there was an Apple One, but no information about the owner and no information is it a real Apple One. For example, there is one museum showing an Apple One, but only you can see the case. So no one knows is there an Apple One really inside or is it just the case. So this would be a maybe existing Apple One. So um, you, you're counting and documenting uh, objects that, that are not um, available to you, where you uh, only yeah. um, only have access through through media, sometimes only through hearsay. So if an Apple One really exists, it's it's very easy for me. If it is in a museum, if I have seen it by myself or maybe someone else I trust told me there is an Apple One and probably he sent me some pictures, then it is perfectly safe. It is a real existing Apple One. But if it is just a picture, it could be a picture from the past, it could be already destroyed or whatever, or it could be a, 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 a duplicated a listed Apple One. So it, it's, it's not so easy, but so far I found 62 really existing Apple One and maybe 20 more. Okay. And um, I presume most of these machines do not work today or are most of them in working condition? No, most work. Oh. And yeah, in the beginning, let's say in 2010, I found just a couple of Apple One. So it looked like maybe 10 or 20 exist, not more. And it was really something special to have an Apple One in working condition. But today, I would say almost every Apple One is in working condition, except just a few. So probably 90% or more are working. After all, only yeah, less than a hundred uh, pieces. Um, that seems comparatively, sm uh, comparatively few. Um, why are there in the first place so few Apple Ones available today? Um, someone told me that um, really early on the Apple One was uh, a collector's item for uh, quite a few people. But um, is it that only few were pr produced? Do we know how many Apple Ones were produced in the first place? Or what happened to them? Okay. The main reason is only 200 were produced ever. So. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak produced only 100 in the first batch. It was in uh, in about April 76. And later they ordered 100 more. So only 200 were ordered all together. And if you have a look, 200 Apple One, and we are 45 years after producing the Apple One, and maybe 60 to, let's say, 90 may exist. That's quite a lot. It's remarkable to have so many Apple One so surviving all these years. Okay, so it's indeed um, about about one fourth, or maybe even more, if some of those twenty. Um, well, it's uh, it's uh, one a third to a half of every uh, Apple One that was produced that it's still existing. So some people told me on the phone, some on an email. Uh, I had an Apple One and it was destroyed. I had one wonderful call. He told me he was a child and uh, his father wanted to have um, wanted to have him to clean his room, but uh, he didn't. So the father broke the Apple One into pieces and uh, threw it away. So uh, things happen. That, that is really really a pity from from today's. Uh, point of view, but yeah, um, from from your perspective, um, what what interests you in these machines? What is special about them? First of all, it's a wonderful piece of history. So I do collect quite a lot of vintage computers, mainly from the seventies, and the Apple One was the first ever product of Apple, and it's a milestone. No Apple One, no Apple company. It's pretty simple. It was the beginning of the Apple company. It's now the most valuable company in the world. 
and it encouraged Steve Jobs and mostly Steve Wozniak to build the Apple II. So Steve Wozniak saw that, oh, there's a market, there's some interest in this hobby computer, and he builds a much more successful Apple II. To be honest, an Apple I is a not very useful computer. It's just for some enthusiasts to have a look to a real personal computer. But the Apple II, that's a computer you can use at home. Everyone, everyone was able to use an Apple II. The Apple I was only for some people who were able to attach a keyboard by themselves to build a power supply and so on. So it was not for everyone. Yeah, we we uh, discovered that ourselves when we uh, managed to to get our Apple One working again. That there's a really a lot of work in collecting all these peripherals, connecting them, and what keyboard do you use and what power supply? Because there's nothing um, that was delivered with the board itself. Uh, at that oh, time. it was really just the board, and later it was uh, um, possible to get a cassette interface. But that's it. So. You had to find a keyboard that is working. You had to attach it to the main board in the right direction. If you attach it to the main board in the wrong direction, it will destroy the Apple One. So, well, it, it, it was not for everyone. Yeah. Um, I forgot that uh, you own more than one Apple One. Is that correct? And um, yes. people can see at least one of them, I believe. Could you tell us about them? I gave one of my Apple One to the museum in Munich. It's the biggest museum in the world for uh, scientific and so on. And it was in 2017, I guess. Yeah. So it's now in the Deutsche Museum in Munich and it's on display. And yeah. So I thought it's, uh, it's so much better to have it on display than in, uh, in the bank fold. People can have a look, and um, I can share the experience to to see a real Apple One. And in well, in Germany we have uh, Apple One in your museum, but um, this museum in Munich see quite a lot of people, so it's probably a good idea to have one over there. And yeah. not many Apple One are in the museum, so we will find some in, uh, in the US, some in Europe, and one in. Uh, Korea oh, and, and Australia. From the Apple One registry, what would you say is the most interesting um, uh, Apple One to you? What is um, oh. is there there any any one that that you would say, hey, look <laughs> yeah, at that, this that's one? That's pretty easy. It is a one that is not available anymore, or probably not available anymore. It's a prototype. So there is a prototype built by. Steve Bosniak, and he used um, soldering a point to point, and it's in an ugly uh, wooden case, and it really looks not like a computer. But unfortunately, no one knows where is this computer. So it was on display in a museum, an Apple museum, but the time Steve Jobs returned to Apple, he ordered immediately to destroy everything. But I can't believe it is really destroyed. I'm really sure someone took all the parts. Later, Steve Wozniak told some uh, people in an interview, he had a prototype in his garage and there was a terrible, terrible fire in his garage and it was destroyed. But really, maybe he still own it, um, but no one knows. Okay. And for sure, that would be the most interesting Apple One of all, just because it was the first one, it was a prototype. And the second most interesting would be the one Steve Jobs had on his table. It is in a metal case. So in the early days of Apple, uh, they gave 50 Apple One to the bike shop. And Paul Terrell running the bike shop was really not happy to see just the main board and he had to find a power supply, a keyboard, and there was no case at all. 
and he expected a real computer in a case. So you just have to plug it in, switch it on, and that's it. But that's not the Apple one. So Steve Jobs was looking for a case, and he ordered a metal case, a beautiful metal case, and it's now on display in a museum in Seattle. So that would be my number two. I believe there are so many more stories about the the uh, several uh, Apple ones uh, all around the world that we could uh, talk about. But for now, I would uh, very much thank you for your time and for your, for sharing these uh, these stories with us. And uh, yeah, I wish you uh, a great World yeah. Computer Day. Goodbye. Okay. Thank you so much. Our next guest now with me is Corey Cohn. He is uh, co-founder of the Vintage Computing Federation. And yeah, he um, restored um, some Apple One machines. And I wanted to talk uh, to him about that restoration work. Great to have you with us, Corey. Corey. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Um, could you just uh, to get our um, viewers a bit uh, information about you and the uh, Vintage Computing Federation? What is the VFC? What do you do? And yeah, tell about it. Okay, so uh, BCF is a an organization that um, that is involved with not just helping museums around the world with exhibits and things like that, and and research and history. But we also have our own museum on the East Coast of the United States. Um, we host or help host vintage computer festivals where people can show off their vintage computers. There are usually uh, places where people can trade or sell vintage computing components and systems. Uh, we host a few ourselves in the United States. We assist hosting a few others through association. And we also help host some of the uh, shows in, the, in Europe. Um, for example, we're, we're involved with helping marketing and other things with BCF Italia, and we usually give a keynote there as well. Yeah. Um, so you said you help museums with um, dealing with older computers. Um, one of the um, yeah, more prestigious um, Apple One, um, uh, which was bought in the last years, um, by the Henry Ford Museum in Detroit was indeed handled by you. Could you tell us a bit about that machine and yeah, in what state did you get it and uh, what had you do had you to do with it? Sure. So um, typically when you have, for example, like a Commodore 64 or a, a TRS-80 and you have questions about it, you can, you can ask questions you know, on how to restore it by going to something like uh, the VC. BC Fed or Vintage Computer Federation forums online. But when you have something as valuable and as rare as an Apple One, it's not so easy. So there are a few of us, we'll call it experts out there, who are um, experienced and well-versed in not only working on these machines that have such high value to, to kind of make sure we keep them as original as possible, but also having the ability to get them running without changing too much, without... Um, damaging the boards or impacting their originality is, uh, you know, for the most part. Um, so Henry Ford's uh, board, I was involved with um, when it first was came came out from under glass. So that machine was under glass from the early 1980s because uh, the Apple one was really a collector's item very early on. It was only a few years old and people started collecting them. And that particular one had been kept under glass for a long time under under a plexiglass cover. So I had to bring it back to uh, operational state and curate it and clean it up and make sure that it was uh, uh, stable so that it wouldn't deteriorate over time. And then there were some also some uh, some little, I would say, caveats with relating to the keyboard, which was a mil spec um, surplus keyboard, getting that running, which was not easy, no schematics, that kind of stuff. So it was a it was a fun little project. Um, I got it running and then Henry Ford bought it at auction. I even went out and helped Henry Ford film some videos of it running. Um, so it, it's a really nice example, um, especially because it was so well preserved being under 
uh, under the plexiglass and its provenance was known pretty far back, which uh, is rare. A lot of these, like even my own, for example, my own Apple one, um, I can only trace the provenance back to about 1988. Um, there's only a handful that you can really go all the way back, uh, you know, into the 1970s. So it, it's it's nice to have ones with with really good provenance and known provenance. And when it was sitting publicly under glass for a very long time, that's some pretty good provenance. Was it hard to make it run again? Or is it just plug it in, test some voltages and hooray, it's going? I have yet to see an Apple one that's you can just plug it in and go uh, without um, some problem. So the design was very much a marginal design in 1976. And when I say marginal, it's not that um, Waz did a poor job designing it. It's that he was very much with the attitude of how can I make this as minimalistic as possible using the least amount of components. And he did that for cost reasons. But because of that, much of the Apple one is fairly marginal in a uh, in it was in its original state when the components were new there's a lot of electrical restoration that happens with the components that involve you know reforming capacitors and resetting uh ceramic capacitors as well through carry point and these things are all done because you need it within a certain margin to be reliable just because an apple one can turn on and run the checkout program doesn't actually mean it works and is reliable. You need an Apple one where you could load basic up, which uses all the memory in the machine based uh, essentially, and be able to run a program for hours and hours on end. And my goal is always to be able to run a machine a minimum of eight hours without an error or sometimes longer. My own Apple one, I've run seven days uh, in its original bike shop case. So I had to have a fan blowing on it because the bike shop case has terrible, um, Uh, terrible uh, uh, ventilation, which is why I actually almost never run it. I was always running in a separate case. But um, but the idea is that they need to be able to run for a while. And just because of that, it's not just turn it on and go. Plus those big giant blue capacitors you see uh, over your shoulder in your in the in your background. If those are have any sort of shorts or any sort of problems, they can actually pop leak goo which can ruin the board or even catch on fire so it's not a simple task it's a bit nerve-wracking uh the first power up um if you haven't done everything um i've seen a lot of apple ones i said you know a lot there's not a lot of apple ones but i've seen a a handful of apple ones where people have replaced those capacitors and we try not to because that impacts the originality and you know you simply replace one of those capacitors could have a hundred just for a single capacitor a hundred thousand euro impact to its value so it, it's important we keep these things original and um and when i say that the uh, uh the henry ford unit was in great condition i meant it didn't have damage from you know being shoved in a closet and something falling on it scratches there's a lot of these boards because they didn't come with a case a lot of people just ran them sitting on a block of wood or just on you know stands and they tend to be get damaged that way right um they tend to get scratches and damage plus um there's also obviously certain boards have defects that were cosmetic and they still went out I, i'm looking at the picture of your board there and a few of the nti boards when they came out and that's an nti board have a spot in the upper Uh, center of the board where it's missing some of the green conforming coat and you can see you have that that's actually a, a, a defect where there was a bubble underneath and a lot of the boards had that because of how this the person it literally had to do with the person who put the coating on because today it's done by machine but back then it was someone coming across with this with a with a squeegee and putting it on it happened to be that's where their hand moved up and it created and it created a spot that over time bubbles and pops off Okay, so there's a, a huge amount of detail um, you know about these boards and I'm really <laughs> surprised you can just from an image um, identify some of these issues uh, because, um, of course, when we put our board to the test, we did not let it run for eight hours or so. 
um, we were happy that it worked when we powered it on and uh, did some some checks and some programming. But it's great to to hear how um, yeah how much work someone can put into these um, seemingly old old fashioned computers. Um, yeah, no. it's great to to uh, hear from you and. Uh, I would like to thank you for being on our channel and yeah, I wish you uh, wish you luck with the uh, next Apple one that comes your way. Yeah, people, that's it. That was uh, a series of talks and interviews uh, conducted in the last weeks. And I had a great fun doing that. So many interesting people, so many worthwhile stories, so many things worth sharing and listening to. I hope you enjoyed it as well. If you want to dig deeper, you might, for example, be interested in the other events uh, on the World Computer Day. Just head over to their website. Jim has collected all kinds of events you might participate in or you might look at in video or other form. Or you uh, might be interested in the Apple One as an computer from the past, you might, for example, head over to the Apple One registry and research some of the machines listed there, or you could um, use their virtual Apple One. Or maybe you would uh, rather um, head over to the 8-Bit Guy's video on his Apple One and um, his explanation how this machine works and what all these chips are doing exactly. Um, maybe that interests you more or maybe you're interested in uh, further preserving the history of computing for example the uh, history of computing and learning and education um, there's a great project by Liza Loop um, found under hcle.org um, you might for example participate in collecting these stories and researching them more so they do not get lost time somewhere in the future. Whatever you do, I wish you a great World Computer Day and uh, good night.